All right. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to the 16th episode of Alta Asks Live. Um, my name is Beth Spotswood. I'm Alta's digital editor and your hostess here at Alta Asks Live. I am really excited um, to welcome today's guest, Alex Espinosa, author of Cruising, a book we reviewed in our previous uh, issue, as well as A Concordance of Stories, which is this really kind of insightful look at a writers, a community of writers um, that's go been going for 50 years. So he's gonna join us today to talk to Heather Scott Partington, who runs all of most of our Alta Asks Live and does an incredible <laughs> job. She is a book critic, an educator, a frequent, frequent, frequent Alta contributor, and I think a longtime friend of Alex's. So this should be a fun, um, Conversation, hopefully not full of, not too full of inside jokes. Keep us in the loop, guys. <laughs> we'll try. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, but please have fun. I'm actually going to add a button right now, a link to buy cruising. Um, check it out on bookshop.org, which supports independent booksellers. So I will get that up as they chat. Please do ask any questions you have for Alex about his work, about anything that's going on, um, or yeah, for Heather. <laughs> It's anything, literally anything. Um, and I will ask, um, I will pop back and ask them at the end. But without further ado, I'm going to let Heather and Alex take it away and um, have a great time. Thank you. Thank Beth. you. Hey, Alex. Thanks so much for joining us. No problem. Thanks for having me. I like your Absolutely. blouse. You look, it's, oh. it's a beautiful pattern. I'm just wearing it's... my basic boring black shirt. <laughs> I'm working my way through all of my teacher clothes um, every week. So <laughs> I'm trying to <laughs> trying to bring something new. Um, so I'm really excited. We're going to talk about cruising in just a little bit. But I wanted to um, first, I just wanted to ask you how it's been going since the pandemic. How have you been? That's a big question. How have I, yeah, I know. Um, you know, I mean, just holding up. OK, I, one of the things I, I, I think I realized is I, I should have been a little more, um, uh, uh, I guess, cognizant of my furniture choices in my house because <laughs> I'm finding that like the stuff that I thought was comfortable, like, uh -huh. like, you know, I bought things not with the intention of like realizing like I'm going to be sitting in this chair for um, like 11 weeks. How comfortable right. is it? So I was just really thinking it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was going to say, I was just thinking about that yesterday about when it gets cold outside, like if we have to keep doing this and I can't be out in the sunshine, my furniture is not comfy enough for yeah. full-time use. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I think one of the things that I'm, I'm really beginning to realize um, through, while spending so much time at home is I'm really reevaluating uh, how I use my space, right? Yeah. Um, how, how space in my house functions. Um, you know, we live in a small 900 square foot house in, in LA uh, and it's two of us. It's me and my partner, Kyle, who's, who's working from home and our two dogs. Mm -hmm. So it's been, it's been a bit of a challenge. Um, I do find that I miss, um, I miss people. Um, yeah. I teach at UC Riverside. Um, I had just wrapped up my first quarter uh, back and um, was loving my, my winter quarter experience. Mm -hmm. And I was really looking forward to the spring. Um, and then we got word that we weren't going to be going back for spring. So, um, I'm missing campus a lot. I'm missing my students a lot. Um, and, um, but, you know, hopefully absence does make the heart grow fonder and yeah. get back, you know, I'm going to be totally happy. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So I'm, I, I'm in there. um, I want to let our viewers know too, that Alex wrote a beautiful op-ed that was in the New York, I'm sorry, in the LA times in April. Um, about his experience being at home and just the wonderful place that he's living, um, his neighborhood. It's awesome. So you guys should check that out if um, if you can. And then, um, as Beth said, in our new um, science fiction issue of Alta, um, Alex has an essay about the community of writers. And I, before we talk about the book, I um, wondered if you could just briefly kind of talk about what the community of writers is and, and what it has meant to you as yeah. a writer. Yeah, the community of writers is the oldest, um, you know, writing conference. Um, as far as we know, I, I, um, I think it's, it has been confirmed that it's the oldest writing uh, conference on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. um, and it was founded um, by uh, Oakley Hall, 
who was a fantastic California writer um, and was also the founding director of the MFA program in creative writing at, at UC Irvine. Mm -hmm. um, I um, attended in 2003, 2004, when I was a graduate student at UC Irvine. And um, I was very shy, I was very uncomfortable. Um, uh, I didn't know many of the people, um, but the community did welcome me in with open arms. And uh, one year when I was there, I actually met my literary agent who mm -hmm. um, just on a lark um, asked me, so what are you working on? <laughs> and um, I'd gone to two writing workshops that summer. Mm -hmm. um, so by the time I got to the community of writers that year, I was, I was just spent. My brain was going in all kinds of different directions. And she asked me, so what are you working on? And I was working on my first book, Stillwater Saints. And I was so dismissive. I just was like, I don't know. I've got this book about this old woman that runs this botanica. And do you know what a botanica is? Of course you don't. It's this shop. <laughs> and I was just so dismissive because I was so tired. And, and it actually turned out that um, she, she reached out to me and she said, can I see that book when you're done. And I said, well, I've still got work to do on it. Um, so I ended up you know, meeting my literary agent there and um, I've gone back um, as a faculty now. Um, and then I'm on the board of directors now. Um, so the community has meant a lot of things to me. I've met and made some really fantastic friends there and um, have seen the community grow over the years, really flourish. Um, and um, I'm excited to see what the next 50 years will bring. And my piece in Alta, you know, we were supposed to have this big celebration. Um, uh, and uh, unfortunately, because of the realities that we're facing, we couldn't do that. So I, I felt that it was um, it, my responsibility to write something. And luckily, you know, I had people at Alta who are interested in, in it. And so that's why I submitted it there and it got published. That's awesome. And um, I think we can have Beth probably put a link up in the in the chat too, so people can can see yeah. that. It's, it's great. Yeah. And and also I I I I do want to say that one of the things that was really important um, um, happening um, based on a lot of the um, you know the the changes that are going on in this country, not just with the pandemic, but with George Floyd and the protests. And um, one of the things that the community has done is um, uh, changed our name so mm -hmm. um, we are simply now the community of writers um and um we um we feel that that's a more inclusive word um it doesn't um pay disrespect to native american communities um so we've dropped the other word um mm -hmm. and so from now on we are the community of writers great that's i'm glad that you mentioned that too that's wonderful um, so let's get into talking about your book, which is very personal, <laughs> the awkward transition. <laughs> very personal. Very personal, um, which I was expecting. I knew kind of going into it that it has memoir elements, but it's also um, inclusive of so much research and so much history. There's a wonderful balance of um, of both, of, of bringing your own story into it, but also looking at um, uh, what has the history of cruising been over time? So can you just give kind of an, an overview of what the book is about and, and just talk about how did you find that balance for yourself? What was important to you about uh, balancing those two things? Um, the, the book is really um, kind of takes a historical uh, and cultural look at the practice of cruising. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to really explore and examine this um, you know, misunderstood practice. I think there's a sort of taboo around it. Um, you know, we we and a lot of those those misconceptions have been shaped by um, our um, what we've seen um, in 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 um, in the media, uh, on television, um, in movies. Um, mm -hmm. That that it's this practice that's sort of deviant, and and if you participate in it, you're uh, you have some sort of psychological problems. So I really wanted to demystify it. I really wanted to show it not, not as an act of, of perversion, but as an act of, of, of revolution and resistance in the gay community. So I, you know, the book looks at, at the practice of, of cruising and hooking up for sex um, in ancient Greece, in Rome, um, during the Victorian era with the Molly houses, which were like prototypes of gay clubs. 
um, the tea rooms, the, the, the tea rooms in, in post-World post War II uh, America. Um, you know, I look at George Michael and his experience <laughs> getting busted in a bathroom in, in, in Beverly Hills. Um, Larry Craig, the senator who was in an airport bathroom who got caught. Um, and then sprinkled throughout it are my own experiences as, mm -hmm. uh, you know, go, growing up in 1980s Southern California and the first time I had an encounter with someone uh, and how that opened me up to um, this world that was existing kind of parallel to ours, but it was kind of like this alternate reality that I could step into. And, you know, I was born with a disability and I was born... Um, I always felt really ashamed of my body um, uh, because of it, um, because of my, my disability and also because of my alopecia and my hair loss. So growing up, I always felt um, that there was something wrong with me, right? Mm -hmm. that, that there was something ill or, or um, I had a sickness. Um, and I think when I was introduced to that world of anonymous sexual encounters, that kind of got rubbed away. Um, and my, the only thing that really mattered was um, my ability to both be sexual and sexualized, right, on my own terms. And so it, it kind of provided me with a little bit of, um, of power, I guess, and, and a way mm -hmm. to negotiate this world um, a little more. And so that, you know, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I guess it's sort of like, you know, I wanted to not just look at the historical ramifications of this practice, but I also wanted to put it into a, a personal perspective uh, to show people that um, a lot of times these historical movements um, are very much grounded in personal experiences, right? Um, you know, we have to uh, we have to enter into a dialogue with a, with these larger sort of historical movements by looking at them from a very personal lens. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how I balanced it. And yeah, it, you know, it, it just, I, I just went with it. And, and while I was writing it, I was, I was kind of a little scared because I was writing some very personal things, but thankfully my, my editor um, at my editors at unnamed uh, Olivia Taylor Smith and, and Chris Heiser, who are fantastic mm -hmm. um, kind of gave me free license. They're like, just, you know, go in any direction you want to go. We'll support you. Um, and it was a, I had a, it was a quick turnaround and I had a lot of stuff going on at the time that I was writing it. I was moving from Fresno back down to LA. And then I was chairing a department, uh, when I was at Cal State LA. So, and I was writing this book. So I really didn't have much time to think about all the personal stuff that I was writing. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was a good thing because I, I didn't hold back, but then when it came out, I was like, Oh shit. Like, yeah. Right, you know? oh, yeah. God. So, what, so anyway, what has it been like for you um, after putting something so personal into the world? Uh, what's the reaction been like? You know, the thing is, is it's, it's, it's actually like the thing that I was most afraid of um, did come to fruition, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something I tell my students all the time. I ask my students to really strive to tell the kinds of stories that um, uh, they feel expose them to most vulnerabilities, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I found that in, in me telling my truth and in me, you know, basically bearing it <laughs> and saying, you know, this is what I did and this is where I did it. Um, actually, a lot of, a lot of um, I've gotten a lot of responses from, from other gay men who have, who have thanked me, who have said, you know, mm -hmm. I, thank you so much for putting, you know, your experiences out there. I had similar experiences. I thought it was just me, but, you know, it, it, I always felt weird um, um, admitting that I enjoyed it so much, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and you helped me sort of be able to say that I could, in, that I could enjoy this. Um, so, so I was initially afraid of, of, of how it was going to sort of paint me or, or you know, how I was going to be depicted, but, you know, that it couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, young people, young gay men, you know, have um, thanked me um, also for, I think, I think a lot of our history is missing. A lot of the history of the LGBTQ community um, has been erased. And a lot of that has to do with how the AIDS crisis in the eighties kind of, um, you know, eliminated a lot of those voices, right? So there's a big yeah. gap. And a lot of the younger um, uh, gay and LGBTQ readers have come up to me and said, you know, thank you. I, I never knew about this in our community. 
Um, and then that there's that older gay community that remembers it, that is sort of praising mm -hmm. me for, for having put their experiences on the page. So it's like, I'm seeing two generations of, of gay men, you know, uh, reacting to it very differently and sort of, I'm in yeah. so it's been really cool. And, um, I'm, I'm glad now that I, that I, I had Chris and Olivia, um, give me free license to be as honest and as candid as possible. And, and to say, you know, the more, uh, the more honest you are, I think the more people will, 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 will respond and, and they have. So yeah. but I didn't expect it at all. Yeah. One of the things that I, uh, that I thought was so interesting was, um, in kind of talking about this as, as being, um, uh, a, like a great, Equalizer, you talked a lot about privilege in the gay community. I was wondering if you could just kind of talk about um, uh, sort of what you mentioned in the book about that. Um, what's what's the role of cruising in sort of combating privilege or addressing privilege in the yeah. gay community? Well, I think, you know, I mean, I grew up, I grew up in here in Southern California in LA, um, just outside of LA in the city of La Puente. And, you know, we were all, you know, working class, Latino, hyper-Catholic boys who were in the closet, you know, the, the place that we went to was West Hollywood, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where we went to sort of like, you know, strut, right? Or we'd go to the nightclubs. And, and I never felt comfortable in those spaces because, because of my other piece and because of my, my arm. Um, my friends were, you know, Mexican American, they were Latinos, they, you know, had nice hair, they dressed really well. And, you know, um, they always got the looks, they always got the, like, the phone numbers. And I kind of was the ugly duckling that would just sort of like, hang out in the back, right. And I never got, you know, a phone number or anything, I, I always felt overlooked. And I think that was back then, um, that, uh, that community was predominantly white. So it was gay mm -hmm. white men. And there was a certain, uh, I guess, fetishizing of, of the brown body mm -hmm. um, that I never sort of um, uh, fit into, right? That, that I wasn't what they were looking for. Um, so one of the things that I found um, that the cruising space gave me is that it gave me the ability to sort of cloak my um, disabilities, right? Um, no one there cared um, that I was disabled or that, you know, I was losing my hair or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was all about the anonymity of it, right? It was all about the, um, the, the you know, the potential for se sexually, you know, charged experiences in public places that dictated um, how um, people responded to me, how men responded mm -hmm. to me. And, um, and that kind of that was a rush for me. It was uh -huh. it was really cool to be able to say that I can go into those spaces and be intimate with someone, um, and and have them desire me and and me mm -hmm. desire them on my own terms. So um, you know, it it kind of felt like like um, that space was where I thrived, where my sexuality kind of thrived. And one of the things that I really wanted to do in the book was I really wanted to talk about that dichotomy of the, the sort of the privilege of the, of the, you know, the gay white class um, and, and how it pertains to um, the, the fetishizing of bodies of color, right? Mm -hmm. um, I wanted um, more than anything to, um, to really brown the experiences of cruising, right? Mm -hmm. um, to, um, to, to take it away from the, the usual perspective of the sort of the, the white gay experience. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say that I didn't address that. I certainly did. And right. I did a lot of a lot of gay white men who were also in the closet, who were raised very hyper Catholic. But one of the things I really wanted to do is I really wanted to sort of decolonize the whole idea of of cruising as a as an act, um, as a very sort of you know um, gay American act, right? Um, yeah. Uh, and so that's why I interviewed people. I, I, I looked at, you know, I talked to people from Uganda. I talked to um, mm -hmm. uh, tons of gay men of color to, to sort of talk about their experiences too, because I felt it was important uh, to reshape yeah. the conversation. Yeah, I think um, the sections that are about Russia and Uganda especially, um, you know, are important as we're talking about what's, what's happening now or more recently in history. And, you know, one of the things that I, one of the threads that I saw running through multiple sections of the book is um, who gets to tell stories, whose stories do we know? 
Um, and I, I just think it's, um, it's phenomenal on, um, on that look. Phenomenal. Look, I can't talk to this. <laughs> phenomenal. You've been doing this like at, what, 16 times? I don't, right? cool. I don't know. It, yeah. Um, at exploring that, that idea through multiple, um, multiple parts of the narrative, you know, the historical parts, the current parts, looking at technology, looking at your own story, um, you know, that all these things are, are really just working together to, um, to draw attention to that. I think that's, that's really important. Ah, knocking my stuff around. Um, so you have a, a section that you'd like to read for us today from the book, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to read a section that's, that is, it's PG-13, um, <laughs> as I promised. Um, the juicier things, I guess, I guess you're going to have to, you're going to have to go get the book to read those. Buy the um, book, people. <laughs> But, but, you know, I, I want to say also that, like, the thing that was, one of the things that was particularly challenging about writing this book was that um, there really wasn't um, a comprehensive sort of cultural and sociological um, uh, book on on cruising, right? So I, I found myself um, looking at, at, you know, psychology books, uh, mm -hmm. sociology textbooks, architecture, art, music. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, perform like all of these different um, uh, um, sources, I think. And that was one of the, the challenges of, of writing this book, but it was also um, a reward because um, it kind of gave me the opportunity to really sort of craft it, you know. Um, and the book sold also um, in Spain. Uh, my mm -hmm. publishers in Spain are fantastic. Spain loves this book. The, huh. the, the Spanish readers, they did a... Um, uh, the big sort of um, the big uh, um, uh, book event um, when the book um, was published in Spain was it was done at a sex club actually. Oh wow! <laughs> sex club. That's how they hosted it. So I thought that was cool. I was like, damn, I wish I could have gone. Um, yeah. But you know, it, the, my publishers in, in Spain, Dos Bigotes, um, have been fantastic. Um, so you know, it's really comforting to know that that an audience across the Atlantic is also reading it. But anyway, the section I'm going to read is. Um, it's toward the end. And um, I think one of the things that I, I really wanted to emphasize um, with the book is um, this idea of movement, um, mm -hmm. this idea of, of, um, of cruising, of going from one space to another, uh, what you take with you when you go um, and how different you're changed. Um, and so this is a section at the very end, uh, chapter 12, and the, the chapter is called The Magic and it's a short section. My experiences have been forged by migration and by the constant and steady flow of bodies and ideas perpetually in transit. My father left my mother and siblings alone in their isolated rancho in the highlands of Michoacan and traveled north to the US, sneaking across the border, moving from Texas to Nebraska to Illinois before following the stream of relatives to California where they all eventually settled. My mother couldn't stay put either Never one to wait, she gathered her children up and early one morning boarded a train and headed north to Tijuana to stay with relatives. And there she sent word to my father. And when they reunited, he insisted she tell him why she ignored his request that she stay put. She replied, you must think I'm stupid. I wasn't gonna just wait for you. She used to laugh whenever she told me the story, shaking her head in disbelief. She wasn't thinking, she said. She only knew that if she stayed there in that small pueblo, in that cold brick house with no running water or electricity, she would surely die and so would her children. Everyone was going, she said. The whole rancho was emptying out. There was nothing left. I wasn't gonna just sit by and watch. So I gathered your brothers and sisters and we picked ourselves up and we left too. I've traced the route they took decades ago by train north into Guanajuato, its hillsides gouged out by miners who discovered plata, silver, hundreds of years before. Northwest through Jalisco, past the fields of agave farms and distilleries that produce tequila. Still farther northwest into Durango, Charro country, through Sinaloa, past Hermosillo, and into the border state of Baja California Norte, to Tijuana, where I would eventually be born. Conceived in California, she insisted I be born back in the Tierra Sagrada of home, that place of ever-changing makeshift colonias, some falling off the map overnight, others springing up so quickly 
They didn't even have names for them. Perhaps she sensed the spirit stirring in me, jabbing at her rib cage, imploring her to get up and go. I see patterns of movement in everything, in the monarch butterflies of my homeland, in the caravans of people streaming out of countries where civil unrest and guerrilla warfare fueled by dictators and despots makes life insufferable. Across the Bering Strait, down from the icy north into the forests of Southern Mexico and Central America and into the jungles and tropical forests of Brazil, movement is in our blood. So I'll stop there. See, that Thank was very- you. <laughs> It was, it was very uh, safe for work. That, that section Stay of the book. Work, yeah. <laughs> yeah. NSFW, right? We don't yeah. want to hear that. Yes. Oh, there, I will uh, I will let our viewers know there are definitely some sections that are not safer. <laughs> <laughs> but those are, you know, those are really interesting too. Um, it's been awesome to talk to keep talking about this for a long time because I have even more questions and things that I'd love to talk about. But we have to have Beth um, come back with the questions from the chat. We get to have that. Come back. <laughs> we have to. <laughs> Hi. Um, we've got a question from, or just a really a comment from Susan Strait, but oh, I think Susan. that it, but I think it can um, lead to kind of an interesting question. You both have what appear to be impressive libraries behind you. Oh, mine is not. This is just. This is like I have more stuff in my storage unit. So what? <laughs> I mean, have you have you seen those um, people are analyzing now that we're all doing these calls from home, analyzing what's in the the background, the, it, what's in the background. So can you tell I mean, is there anything we'd be surprised to find behind each of you? Uh, Do you, have like a, you know, 50 shades of gray back there. Surprised. I was judging a contest and I kept this Parker posing. Um, <laughs> you're on an airplane, a self mythologizing memoir. I don't know why I kept it. <laughs> but Parker, hey, who doesn't? Parker Posey is pretty fabulous. Parker Posey is pretty awesome. Yeah. I think it was Kyle who asked me to keep that one because um, I judged a literary contest, um, a big literary prize. And um, they sent me a bunch of books and that was one of them. And as I was going through and um, calling a lot of books, um, we saw that one and Kyle said, you should keep that one because I want to read it. It hasn't read it, so it's <laughs> in itself. Um, but right now what's, what, I, what I have read or am reading is, um, I have some books here. Uh, next on my list to read is The Next Great Migration by Sonia Shah, who also wrote about, um, uh, is is a is a science writer. She writes about uh, pandemics and Ebola and all that stuff. So yeah. she's getting she's getting a lot of play mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. Um, I just got this one, "Sharks in the Time of Saviors" by Kwame Strong Washburn, which is getting a lot of buzz. So I'm really excited about uh, diving into that one. Um, I read this memoir um, that blew me away. Um, and it's Miracle Country by uh, this writer named Kendra Atleywork. And I strongly encourage people to read this one. Uh, she writes about uh, growing up in Eastern California um, in um, Bishop um, and her mother, um, she loses her mother at a, at a very um, difficult time, um, but it's, it's beautiful. Um, and I started to read this one um, at the beginning of the pandemic and um, there's a lot of, ref you know, a lot of scenes that take place outdoors uh, in the beautiful countryside of Bishop, um, a place in California that we rarely um, really see depicted in literature. So I was really, really happy to read this book. And I've been telling everyone um, that they have to check this one out. Um, trust me, you're going to love it. It's going to make you cry. Um, I just added a link to it in the comments. So yeah. Um no, she's just, she's phenomenal. And it was my good friend, Luis Alberto Urea, who uh, I saw him post something on, on Facebook about it. And then um, I trust everything that Luis says. So I went out and I, I got it. And um, I've just been impressed by it. I've been telling everyone to read it. And then this, actually speaking of Susan, Susan and I were talking recently about, about books. And I mentioned this one. This is by a Latino writer who, a Chicano writer. It came out in 1997. 
It's called Growing Through the Ugly. And it's a novel by um, Diego Vasquez Jr. And this book kind of came and went and not a lot of people really sort of um, um, know about it. And it was published actually by, by um, I think it was uh, Norton. So it was a big publisher. Uh, and it's about, it's narrated by a young man who uh, goes off to Vietnam and um, is enlisted in the army, goes off to Vietnam, dies. And as he's flying back, his body, his body narrates. Um, oh, wow. this novel. So it's kind of like, I tell people like, like the lovely bones, like this is kind yeah, of- I love cool. the lovely bones. Right? Um, and so it's a young Chicano guy who grows up in El Paso, right? And he's narrating his story, but his body is narrating it as he's flying over, flying back home. Um, so it's really tender. It's really dark too. There's a lot of sexual abuse in it, but um, the voice is incredibly, incredibly rich and lyrical. And um, it's the only novel this writer ever wrote, right? Hmm. So I wow. mentioned Susan and um, we were talking about books and I said, oh my God, you got to read that book because it, it's, I read it years ago and it stayed with me. And, um, and then I was looking through my stack trying to find it, but so many of my books are in my storage unit. I think I gave my copy away. So I, I reordered another one uh, from an independent bookstore too. So always support your indie bookstores. Always. Um, last we've we've gone over, but one last question. I get well. You're very interesting. Um, <laughs> is you know you mentioned your kind of strict Catholic upbringing. Um, how has your family read cruising, and how have they responded? <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, my I I do know that um so um. I have nephews who are gay, who I think, um, and one of my nephews and his partner came to my reading at Skylight in, um, mm. in LA at the at the, the book launch. Uh, and it was really cool, but it was also really nerve wracking um, yeah. because, you know, here I was like talking about this, right? But I think one of the things that's been the most uh, refreshing and, and really kind of life altering is is realizing that, you know, I spent so many years um, wracked with guilt about my sexuality and, 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 and feeling very sort of um, uh, uh, not able to really kind of be myself. And, and you know, it, I struggled with it a lot. And to see my nephews um, be so open about their sexuality and, and so proud of it, mm -hmm. um, and then to be there and to to be recognizing, you know, their uncle as having written this book and 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 is sort of being, you know, sex positive and, and all of these things was really revolutionary and really fantastic. And it really, it really brought me to tears because my, you know, I was afraid for a long time and my nephews were basically like, here we are, you know, we're gay and we don't really care. Uh, and and I never grew, I didn't grow up with that that kind of confidence and to see these very smart, very charming, very handsome young men um, take that attitude and, and, you know, and, and tell their friends, like, this is my uncle. Like he wrote this mm -hmm. is, is a thrill to me and it really humbles me and it, it makes me proud and it makes me really hopeful. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's how they've, they've reacted, at least my nephews and nieces. I don't know about mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, well, that's a beautiful way to end this. I, I want to, um, first of all, thank everyone for tuning in. If you missed any part of this interview, it's going to be up on Alta Online later this afternoon, as fast as my little fingers can make that happen. <laughs> um, if you're unfamiliar with Alta, if uh, you haven't checked out our work, we are available at altaonline.com. We've actually got a a gift for the first 100 people who subscribe Ooh. renew give a gift membership right now um so check out altaonline.com if you haven't and most importantly um please support writers like alex who do such incredible work and um we're really honored to have him join us at alta ask live today again buy the book the green button right below us will take you straight to an independent bookseller selling cruising Heather, you are awesome as usual. And Alex, we are very, very grateful um, that you joined us today. Thanks, uh, everyone. Stay thank safe. Thank you, Beth. And thank you, Heather, too. This is so much fun.
Thanks, yeah. Alex. Thanks, right. everyone. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. Here I, I'm ending now. <laughs>